the podcast basically ends at this point, all, all up to this point, I'm thinking this is going to be an amazing reunion story between this mother and mm-hmm. her son. And it ends. And I'm like, what the, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. What is this? And I've got a three and a half year old daughter. The story touched me just for that alone. Mm-hmm. So I like, you know, a little bit upset by this whole thing and I kind of try to let it go. Mm-hmm. I like go to sleep and like literally a few days later or whatever, like in the middle of the middle of the night, I like wake up like, oh my God, I can't imagine what this lady has to be going through. The lack of closure, the having no idea where her son is. Welcome to Everyday Superhumans, the podcast to restore your faith in humanity. I'm Kyle. And I'm Charlie. How are you doing, Charlie? I'm watching Nugget be a vacuum <laughs> on your carpet. <laughs> She's basically a maid. You brought a maid over. She's going to leave a bunch of white fur over here, but I mean, there's I guess there's crumbs in the carpet she's looking up right now, so eye for an eye. She does a really good service. <laughs> She'll be free tonight. She's a good dog, though. She's helping me clean my apartment before I travel out of town this weekend. Yeah, you're going to Colorado. Yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going there for a bachelor party. Oh, don't get too crazy. (laughs) Hopefully we won't. We'll find out. Either way, though, this episode should be out by the time I get back. So we'll find out in the next episode after that, (laughs) of how well it went. We can do a side series on (laughs) Kyle's traveling adventures. Yep. But we're sticking to Austin once again Mm. for our next guest. Yeah. So this is actually a... Really interesting thing that we're having with this guest. Jared Gossett's his name. He is an entrepreneur here in Austin. He owns the company Gossett Co. And he also runs a nonprofit called Project Rise. And then what else does he do? Well, he's actually working on a new project that's philanthropic, which is why we interviewed him. Ooh, tell me more. Well, so Jared Gossett is a fan of the NPR podcast Radio Ambulante, which is an NPR a uh, Latin American podcast about news in Latin America. And he heard this story recently called The Lost Children, which is about a disaster that happened in... Armero? Happened I'll, in... I'll fill in the blanks. I actually <laughs> know... Libs. Yes, we'll do it Mad Libs style. <laughs> this tragedy happened in Armero, which was a volcanic eruption that led to a giant mudslide that basically wiped out this small town in Colombia. And then in the wake of the disaster, a lot of families are displaced from each other. Parents and kids are separated. Siblings are separated. Friends are separated. Basically, it's a complete tragedy to the entire city. Well, the story of the lost children is about this particular woman, Martha Lucia, who lost her son in that tragedy. And for 33 years, she thought that, that he was dead. What we found out recently, though, through this story is that he might still be alive just bad, just due to bad bureaucracy and record keeping. He may have been adopted without anybody's notice. That's or, one theory. Yeah, that's one theory. But we get into these theories into the podcast. But going on about this story, though, Jared was so drawn into this story. He's a father of a young daughter. And it the thought about losing a child in a disaster just like really hit home with him. And he was wondering, like, why nobody's really, like, helping Martha find her son. If it's been 33 years, it's it's a cold case, but we live in a very connected world. So the chances of, like, finding somebody that looks like him right now is still pretty high. So he's calling on Austin Mm -hmm. superhumans Mm -hmm. to join his team in helping search for this boy, who's Mm -hmm. now not a boy, but he's an adult, Mm -hmm. a man. And the whole idea behind this is that using uh, Sergio, that's uh, Martha's son, using Sergio as like a jumping off point to help a bunch of other people that lost their kids in this tragedy reunite with them. Didn't they say 300? About 300. People, so they weren't dead, but Mm. they were just missing. Yeah. And they were never found. Yep. So we speak to Jared in this episode about his mission, his inspiration behind it, and also what his plan of attack is. And I think we have a lot of superhumans in Austin to help join his team and crack this case. It's 1985, November, in Armero, Colombia. And uh, 
this lady who I'm helping, Martha Lucia Lopez. She was a young mother at the time. She had a five-year-old son named Sergio. And they lived in this town of Armero, and it was 25,000 people on the side of this volcanic mountain that had lied dormant for years. Mm -hmm. What happened was the scientists actually um, had known there was some sort of seismic activity happening or whatever you call the activity when you know there might be Mm -hmm. something happening underneath the volcano. Mm -hmm. They had communicated with the government and the government had decided that there was no real issue. Mm -hmm. The government never issued a warning to the citizens of this town and lo and behold, in the middle of the night, this volcano erupted without Mm -hmm. anybody having any warning. And they... uh, um, <laughs> we got, like, over here. We're, we're, <laughs> so we're in the Austin downtown library and it's really pretty, but there is a child crying right <laughs> outside our room. Fell down literally right outside. <laughs> it was the scream is perfect though. And he said, erupted it. <laughs> <laughs> she just is adds. also crying with the mother. Yeah, this just has drama to oh. the, the story. Yeah, 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 I get some background. I mean, it's no background sounds needed. <laughs> Anyways, so. The volcano erupted without warning in the middle of the night. And what happened when the volcano erupted, this is something I never would think about happening. It, the heat from the volcano uh, melted some of the snow or created basically a mudslide Mm -hmm. from the top of the mountain and a massive mudslide that eliminated, wiped out, destroyed Mm -hmm. this entire village in literally a matter of minutes. And of the 25,000 people, most were killed. I think there were 23,000 fatalities mm. in this, making it the worst disaster mm-hmm. in Columbia's history. Martha Lucia made it out alive, but she was separated from her five-year-old son, Sergio. And he didn't make it, or at least so she thought. So she lived the next 30 years of her life uh, with the, the guilt of the loss, the depression of that loss. And in, I believe it was within the last 18 months, she was approached by a journalist named Francisco Gonzalez, who had been covering what happened, the events of Armero mm-hmm. for a long time. He came to her and basically said, I've been researching this over the last few years. There have been some inconsistencies in the stories that I've mm-hmm. discovered and a few families have come forward to me and we're learning that some of the children who they said had died in the event, including Sergio, mm-hmm. actually have made it out alive. Mm-hmm. And I have proof that Sergio not only made it out alive, but made it out alive safely with just a scratch on his, his arm. Mm-hmm. And he went on to de- describe basically an archive that they had dug up that they had found that had records of Mm. not only Sergio, but these other 300 kids Mm -hmm. who'd made it out alive. Mm -hmm. And it had been, we still don't know. There's so many questions Mm -hmm. in the story. We don't know whether, uh, there was malintent, whether there was chaos, whether there was just some sort of disconnect. It probably most likely some combination of all three, but who knows, Mm -hmm. but these archives basically had shown, a lot of children who'd made it out and then had disappeared after that, Mm -hmm. presumably through illegal adoptions or Mm -hmm. we don't know. So Martha Lucia obviously hears this and her world's turned upside down. The knowledge that her son's actually still alive. She has no idea where Francisco Gonzalez has no idea where he's since dedicated his whole life and career to creating a foundation called uh, foundation Armero our foundation Armando Armero to help locate these kids. Mm -hmm. But she calls her brother and, uh, she says, Hey, I want you to know that this man just came forward to me and said that Sergio is still alive. Mm -hmm. And her brother says, I know it's back up for a second. So what happened was when the event, when the tragedy hit, she, was like four or five months pregnant Mm. and she ended up getting rescued and taken to the hospital. And they basically said, Hey, 
you have to immediately go on bed rest. You're at risk of losing this child. Mm-hmm. You can't. And she said, I have <laughs> to go look for time. Yeah. She said, I have to go look for my son. Mm-hmm. I don't know where he is. I can't find him. I have to go look for my son. And they said, you know, no, your village has been destroyed. You can't go look for him. You've got to stay here unless you want to lose your other child. Mm-hmm. So she had to spend the next few months after, as all the other families were out trying to, the other ones who'd been pulled apart from each other, trying to find each other in, in, you know, orphanages Mm -hmm. or in different refugee camps or whatever. She didn't have that Liberty. She was in hospital. So her brother was helping her a little bit, uh, several weeks after all of this happened, got a call from pretty much the, the equivalent of like, I mean, the Colombian Red Cross, more or less, who'd been helping try to put the pieces mm-hmm. together. And they said, hey, we have your nephew, Sergio uh, Melendro. He, we have all of his ID. He just have, has a cut on his, a scrape on his arm. Here's all of the, you know, his information. We just need you to bring ID and come pick him up. So her brother, Sergio's uncle, went to pick him up. And when he got there, they basically said, We have no idea what you're talking about. Nobody called you. You must be mistaken. Mm -hmm. And obviously he was indignant with everything and pushed and pushed, but he could get no information. Mm -hmm. So he, so that experience, he felt like something was awry. Something wasn't wrong or something was wrong. But with his sister being on bed rest, he didn't want to go and already completely grieved and grieved and traumatized. He didn't want to give her any more, Mm -hmm. um, put anything else on her plate mm. so he just never brought it up and yes. was hoping that there would be some break or something and nothing ever happened so he never brought it up but now 30 years later there's something you're saying well and so now 30 years later with this journalist coming to tell her that Sergio is still alive that's when her, she called her brother and told him hey this journalist just told me Sergio is alive and her brother then tells her what happened to him 30 years in the past. Oh, okay. Yeah, saying, well, yeah, this is what happened to me. So continuing to kind of build Mm -hmm. on the whole whole case and and the the mystery mystery of it all. And then probably the most incredible aspect of this whole story and the reason why this got picked up by this NPR podcast, Mm -hmm. her case of all these 300... Over the next few weeks or months, I think that kind of the story gets out amongst her circle of friends or whatever mm-hmm. that of what happened. One of her friends or a distant friend comes to her and basically mm-hmm. says, hey, I uh, have something to tell you also. She said a few months after everything happened, I was traveling in New Orleans and I was shopping at a store in New Orleans and I was approached by this man who started talking to me and saw that I was Latina. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, where are you from? And she said, I'm from Colombia. This man gets so excited and says, really, you're from Colombia? Oh, it's so exciting to meet you. I have a brother who lives in Italy. And my brother just adopted this little boy from Colombia. And he goes to pull out a picture of the little boy. And this little boy was Sergio. Um, Stopping there for a second, I think a lot of people, as I've told the story to to my circle of friends and Mm. and people, uh, the first reaction, this was was mine too, is, well, that sounds really... Uh, you know, is the little boy? She could have easily mistaken him, and she yeah. could. And she the could grief, have. you could definitely mistake something for something else. She could have. The, and so, I think in this whole case, as we're trying to unravel it, we have to consider that's a possibility that it was mistaken identity. Mm-hmm. But there's one very, very powerful aspect to this, and that is Sergio, this little Latino Colombian mm-hmm. five year old boy at the time, had very, very unmistakable blue eyes, which is not common down there Mm -hmm. so i've seen i've seen pictures of him and he's he's a very remarkable little little kid the likelihood of mistaking him would be less for those reasons so anyway he shows her this picture and this woman says oh my god that's my friend's son she was she was taken or he was taken from her in this tragedy a few months ago and at this point 
the details of the story get a little strange, but basically what we know is that this guy uh, started getting uncomfortable once mm. he learned that, possibly because he's like, he had no idea how the, the backstory of how they had adopted this child. Mm. They probably didn't know that this child's family was still alive. Mm. And so this guy more or less disappeared. And it's 1985. And I guess we don't have the resources perhaps to, to track people as maybe we do today. And she went back to Columbia, visited with their friends, and they basically said, well, if there's any way we could track this guy down or have any confidence we could find him, we would do it, but we'd know nothing right now. So they dropped it. And for the same reason that her brother didn't approach Martha Lucia, they didn't approach her because she was going through major grieving Mm -hmm. at the time and was having such a hard time processing everything. They didn't want to put additional weight on her or give her hope when Perhaps there was no way to actualize it. So I'm not justifying what they did. Uh, in fact, I think this whole thing would have been different if they had uh, if they had acted differently. But they didn't. And here we are now. Yeah, well, it's a rough time to be around. Like, you just lost your entire village and a major yeah. mudslide. And your child goes missing. Didn't. You're pregnant. Yeah. And then how do you yeah. deal with all that stuff? Like, I could see why your friends and family tried to, like, relieve her of the stress. Yeah, to keep that from her. Yeah, yeah, of course. So that was the story that I had heard in in this uh, in this podcast. Actually, uh, this this podcast from NPR Radio. Yeah, I'll link to it in the show notes. Okay, cool. So people could read it. Called uh, Radio Ambulante. So anyway, that's her story. I hear that it ends. The podcast basically ends at this point. All, all up to this point, I'm thinking this is going to be an amazing reunion story between this mother and mm-hmm. her son, and it ends. And I'm like, what the, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. What is this? And I've got a three-and-a-half-year-old daughter. Mm-hmm. The story touched me just for that alone. Mm-hmm. But then I dig into it a little bit more, and I, I look on their website, and I realize that they didn't produce it in the podcast, but they had like some sort of kind of notes afterwards saying that Sergio hasn't been found. And really the only clue that they have is that he may be in Italy per this lady's lead. And that's all they have. So I like, you know, a little bit upset by this whole thing and I kind of try to let it go. Mm. I like go to sleep, mm. you know, and like literally a few days later or whatever, like in the middle of the middle of the night i like wake up like oh my god i can't imagine what this lady has to be going through the lack of closure the having no idea where her son is so i just email the producer of the npr Mm -hmm. podcast thinking and i just tell him hey listen i i'm a business owner in austin texas i've got a small nonprofit organization and so i've got a, a decent network of some people here in the states that might could be able to help, you know, I assume that you guys have tons of resources that a lot of people are helping her there in Colombia already. Mm -hmm. And you guys probably don't need anything, but I just feel it's my duty to reach out to you guys and say, if you need any additional resources in the States, I'd be happy to help. So I didn't really figure he'd email me back, but I get a response. He says, actually, nobody's helping her. She doesn't have the resources to really go out and find her son. She doesn't know where to begin at this point. That was pretty much the foray into this entire venture. So I've basically set off on this journey now to do everything I can to, to help her. I'm taking a, a multi pronged approach and I'm very early in the stages. Like I said, I've only been involved in this for about a month. Okay. Um, and you reached out to us like a month ago. So this is like ago. right whenever you thought the idea, you wanted yeah. to get the word out immediately. Yeah. It was f- fortuitous to find you guys in your, in your podcast because it seemed like a great mm. platform to spread this message. My first, but I think the thing, the most impactful concrete thing mm. that I can do right now. And my mission is to create a team of, of people. Of superhumans. Of super <laughs> <laughs> Everyday superhumans have to just throw in that plug. There you <laughs> get some branding halfway through the, yes. to the interview. <laughs> yeah. So I think a small team of, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, eight people or whatever, Austinites, I mean, any, anybody from around the globe who's mm-hmm. interested and has the right skill set, I want to bring onto this team. But w- we as Austinites have some, so many amazingly talented people who I mm-hmm. think, um, and we typically have, so caring i think if we can get a small team of people here in in town to launch into this and 
take a multi-pronged approach, almost kind of an investigative mm-hmm. approach. But what I see, uh, first and foremost, the, the main spoke in the wheel of trying to find him is going to be a filmmaker mm-hmm. and or producer mm-hmm. to go down to Columbia with me mm-hmm. and create like a three to five minute film. Mm-hmm. Somewhat of an interview of think kind of my envisioning of it right now is kind of a little bit of like a 60 minutes type Mm storyline interview of Martha Lucia that's designed to a create a a major emotional connection, which should not be hard to do Mm -hmm. um, with the story and then be, and then be tap into our innate, like uh, investigate. We love solving mysteries. That's why we love watching mystery shows. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is definitely very compelling to listen in on right now. Yeah. So I think create those. If we can create those two components with this three to five minute video, then we'll have something that will be that people will want to share over social media. Mm-hmm. And I want to get this video distributed widely through Colombia and as widely as possible through Italy, and then use that as a foray into possibly a bigger documentary film about the entire thing mm. i think that would be uh, i'm not a filmmaker myself but i would think that would be an amazing project to undertake and reading the the article if i remember correctly there was about 300 missing kids that, yeah. they, that were 300 identified. unaccounted for, or identified but they were never picked up for adoption Is they've never been saying? found since okay that's it yeah yeah and we know that they're alive like they weren't just yeah. because they were taken to a government facility at the time correct yeah yeah, yeah. so if you could document all their stories, that'd be yeah. quite the story to tell. Why are you the one that's helping and not somebody down in Colombia? Like, what's holding them back from working like this? This this is going to sound a little bit maybe too generalized, mm-hmm. but uh, I've traveled extensively down there. I've got uh, okay. a lot of friends down there, and and not that it's an amazing culture. It's one of my favorite places in the world, but there is a little bit different mentality as it revolves around philanthropy, volunteerism, mm-hmm. going out and helping other other people mm-hmm. there than we have here in America. Okay. It's one thing that makes me super mm-hmm. proud about our country and the way we are. They're, again, they're amazing people, but some of my friends down there have said, I really want to help. But there are a great number of people who basically, you know, I've talked to down there and they say, wow, that's a really sad story. I'm sorry to hear that, but there are a lot of missing kids. There are a lot of things wrong in the world. Like, mm-hmm. and, and, and it kind of gets dismissed. And that's why, for instance, this guy, this journalist, Francisco Gonzalez, who's starting foundation, uh, or started foundation Armando Romero, resources are very hard for him to come by. He's got an mm-hmm. amazing cause mm-hmm. here in the States. It would gain a lot more traction, mm-hmm. but there's so much down there. And then, and then also a, l- a little bit more fundamentally, people don't necessarily, not everybody, but it's, it's a, it's a lower, that's the word I'm looking for. I mean, economic, socioeconomically, mm-hmm. it's, it's a little lower than America. So yeah. the, so people's mindsets may be in little different places. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I guess you got to prioritize stuff in your life too. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, but back to, um, I want to share with you guys back to kind of the multi-pronged mm-hmm. strategy. So I want to mm-hmm. create this video. Mm-hmm. So that's first thing, go, go live. So I need filmmakers and mm-hmm. producers uh, and then probably social media strategist branders who are really good at helping us create a brand, a message that people want to share. Mm-hmm. So those are probably the skill sets on mm-hmm. on that component of the project. The other thing is we also need just a home base to send people for information. So we need a website. Mm-hmm. We need a website mm-hmm. with information, have the video on there as well. So I need a, a web developer mm-hmm. for that. The other two components that I see that are uh, that are more far fetched, but I just feel like we have to cover every base. I I want to try to find. I've never looked into this, but there's got to be some sort of like cold case private investigator. Oh yeah, there has to be. You know, who maybe even somebody who lives in in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. We believe that guy may have worked, or at least in some capacity, been affiliated with. It was a United mm-hmm. Colors of Benetton store. Mm-hmm. So we believe there there may have been some sort of affiliation now with that store. So we could possibly go back and try to look at the records from HR records. I don't even know how you begin. Yeah. Especially that far that. back. You yeah. see the eighties, right? Yeah. 85. They might just be like all paper and no longer exist anywhere. Right. Or if they do, it might be like a filing cabinet that, that nobody's looked into for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So th- that would be a long shot, but I at least mm-hmm. want to explore and have that conversation mm-hmm. with some sort of like 
private investigator, cold case type mm-hmm. private investigator, see what they think, if there's any, even any reason to pursue that. And then the last thing that I'm doing is, again, kind of a long shot, uh, hiring a virtual assistant to look at literally every <laughs> Sergio in oh, wow. Italy on Facebook who's got blue eyes and appears mm-hmm. to be in his 30s and message him. Mm-hmm. That's going to be hard. That's going to be very hard. I mean, it's very, it's very time consuming. Yeah, it's a tedious so, task. Yeah, the, the ultimately the best method we have, I think, will be the video. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be creating a really, really well-crafted message mm-hmm. through that video and distributing it to people who will ultimately end up knowing this guy or knowing the story. There are people in Colombia who have information that never came forward. Mm-hmm. So I think also getting the message out to them of, mm-hmm. hey, listen, 30 years have passed. Please come forward if you've got information. So spreading that information through Colombia and Italy, it's going to have to be a really specially crafted message because reasonable possibility the story is true and he was adopted by a family mm-hmm. in Italy. But if it's not true and we can't, we can't rely solely on that, we have to be able to backpedal the message or raise it or pull mm-hmm. back to where we don't get people with blinders on just thinking about that. Mm-hmm. Because he could still be in Colombia. Maybe he was adopted by a family in Colombia. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Or mm-hmm. anywhere, anywhere, really. Because anywhere. if it's an illegal adoption, there's literally no place where he could be. Right. Like, he could be anywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The reality is 30 years have passed. It's mm-hmm. going to be a challenge. Yeah. The odds are probably stacked against us. Mm-hmm. But again, I feel like in this day and age, with the right strategy, it's achievable. Mm-hmm. And even with the low odds for me, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but for me, when when the odds are stacked against me, that's that's when I get interested. Mm. Oh yeah, that's me when too. I like, to, I like to step up. And, yeah. And have that challenge. Yeah. yeah, I like like the chase, yeah. kind of <laughs> in yeah. all aspects of life. Yeah. So it's it's much better. What would be somebody's motivation for illegally do- adopting a kid? Do you know, like, why somebody would adopt this? illegally? Yeah, illegally. Well, like, why would somebody adopt Sergio? And stuff like him hanging out in an orphanage this entire time. Yeah, so I think that you, you may be able to speak to this better mm-hmm. than I can, but my understanding is the adoption process is very, very expensive to go. The, the legal adoption process mm-hmm. is very expensive and very time consuming. And so there are a lot of probably well meaning parents and people out there who want a child mm-hmm. and obviously would want to pay less mm-hmm. to have to adopt it because maybe they can't afford the way that legal route is and don't want to have to wait for however long it takes Mm -hmm. so you've got that market if you want to call it that i hate calling it that but let's just call it that for a second from an economic theory it's a market you know when you've got that demand if you're going to always have have uh poorly intentioned people who are who are going to try to provide supply Mm -hmm. in whatever means they can. So if they got all these kids, we don't know. I hate casting assumptions and judgment at this point, Mm -hmm. but these 300 kids could have been taken and government officials or whoever could have said, Hey, listen, let's go sell these Mm -hmm. kids to good parents, to good adoptive parents, but let's go about it in the back roads and satisfy that need selling, you know, get, mm-hmm. getting them quick and we'll mm-hmm. pocket the money. So mm-hmm. that's one possible scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other possible scenario, which is, which is less nefarious mm-hmm. is also just that some of these kids could have been, and I do believe this happened to at least some of them with the chaos and the aftermath. It was a third world country. You mm-hmm. have, you're not expecting this. Mm-hmm. So you've got the biggest disaster in the country's history. When you go to try to mobilize and make sense of it, who's in charge? Mm -hmm. Who's doing it? You know, you think about it, kids, you get a kid who's crying or whatever. And then some volunteer Mm -hmm. who's coming and helping and they just probably grab them, hand them to their, you know, their family member or friend say, here, let's, this kid needs, needs some food or whatever. Mm -hmm. And kids just, and Mm well-meaning people just end up getting people spread out. Mm -hmm. And then they say, Oh, well, we don't know. It sounds like this kid's, family died because we can't find them mm-hmm. they didn't die it was just the lack of communication and chaos and so they said well his family died so here our friend over here or here or here will adopt him yeah he said it could, it could have been like miscommunication on both sides the parents of the kids are dead and the kids or the people who are handling the kids that the parents are dead so they just did the best thing they could do and which they were is probably adoption. scared too i mean imagine being a little kid yeah 
and yeah. you just i would be scared out of my mind and you just you're so young you just you yeah. just are like oh this is a person that looks like a parent age i guess they know what they're doing yeah yeah so i i think there's so many different plausible scenarios of how everything mm-hmm. could have played out and they probably played out in a lot of different ways mm-hmm. And now your famous question. If you could be a superhuman, uh-huh. what superhuman would you be? What superhero would you be? You can make up your own superhero. What superhero. Or what yeah, superpower be. in your yeah. instance would best help the lost children or the project? Yeah. If you could use wow, a superpower. That's a great. That is a great <laughs> question it's the question that always tells everybody Om- omniscience is that the right is oh yeah the that's a good one everything yeah <laughs> that'd be instantly done the best be like, in the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. omniscience i'd love to have that if you're looking to help out jared gossett and the armero foundation and their mission to find sergio and uh, along with the r300 missing kids check out finding sergio.com or if you want to contact Jared directly to discuss how you'd like to help him out, email him at jared at gossetco.com. That is J-A-R-E-D at G-O-S-S-E-T-T-C-O dot com. Feeling bad about the world? Does the 24-7 news cycle keep you down? Never fear. Everyday Superhumans is here. Restore your faith in humanity at everydaysuperhumans.com, where you can learn all about the people making the world a better place. And don't forget to sign up for our monthly newsletter, where you can learn all about the ways you can become superhuman today. You can also follow us on Twitter at SuperhumansCast, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash everydaysuperhumans, and check out our Instagram at everydaysuperhumans. Have we helped restore your faith in humanity? Then be sure to rate and subscribe to Everyday Superhumans on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podcast Addicts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're feeling really generous, be sure to, to donate to our Patreon at patreon.com slash everyday superhumans. That would be super awesome of you. And remember, not every hero has to fly. So grab your cape and let's go. Have we helped you faith? <laughs> I just tripped over my words right there. <laughs> I knew where you were going. Help, help, help restore. <laughs> this is, we're an award-winning podcast. We can't have trips over words like that.